thank you all for being here. I hope we'll have a little fun. We've been joking, you know. So I want to just talk briefly about how I got interested in this. And obviously, you all are, or you wouldn't be here. Um, the first inkling I had that there was a connection between what science can, it, I, I hate to use the word prove, but what science can uh, um, provide proof for, and what I believe as a minister and as somebody who has studied spirituality for years, the first inkling I had of a connection was back in the late 80s when my children were really small, my husband at the time and I were really good friends with another couple. Scott was a PhD physicist. And he kept talking at the time about A Course in Miracles. At the time, I had never heard of A Course in Miracles. And I was really intrigued that somebody who had a PhD in physics was talking about God, <laughs> you know? And I never really delved much into it. Anything with the word miracle in it intrigued me. And I believe I bought the book at the time. But if any of you have tried to read A Course in Miracles by yourself, it's a little challenging. Later on, I joined groups and study groups and delved really into it. So that was the first inkling. Now, fast forward 25 years after many iterations, uh, like you heard, of, of work um, and much spiritual exploration. I've been a Catholic, and I've been um, attending self-realization, and I've been a lot of different things. I started ministerial school. I became a practitioner. In our philosophy, um, just a couple definitions, it's called, the, the philosophy itself is called the science of mind and spirit, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? That a religious philosophy would have the word science in it. Because our founder, Ernest Holmes, felt very strongly that everything we teach is provable. That it's provable that prayer, for, ex for example, works. So the philosophy is science of mind and spirit. We were called way back when the Church of Religious Science, and I am an ordained minister of religious science. But you know what? We got confused a lot. People thought we were Scientology, which we're not. People thought we were Christian science. We have similar roots to Christian science because we believe in the power of prayer. But as you probably know, Christian science believes you should only pray. You shouldn't go to the doctor. <laughs> we don't believe that, or Ellen wouldn't be probably a member of our congregation. Uh, we clearly believe a pillar of prayer, it's all good, it's all God. So having said that, here I am in ministerial school, and there's a lot of options available. It's a master's in consciousness studies. We're required to take three science classes. Go figure, right? So two of the classes I took were taught by a man you may know the name, um, Dr. Amit Goswami, was a physics professor at the University of Oregon. He's now retired. And he is a quantum physicist. He's an amazing individual. And his, his shtick is clearly that what we're learning from quantum physics and the studies and the research is showing that there is, in fact, a quantum consciousness, which you could call cosmic intelligence, or you could call it God. You could call it spirit. You can call it whatever you want. But what we're teaching in our religions, at least in science of mind, and what quantum physics is showing, is very, very, very similar. So uh, first I want to say that neither Alan nor I consider ourselves true experts in this field. Some of you may know even more than we do. What we are is really enthusiastic, really curious, um, really amazed by some of the things we've learned by studying quantum physics. So two of the experiments, well, and so for me, you know, as a minister studying to be a minister, some of the questions I had is, I believe prayer works. I've had it. Anybody here have prayer work in your life? You know, we've had it work, but how? How, how does it work? You know, I mean, I have my own thoughts, and I guess a lot of what I believe from a religious or a spiritual perspective is more intuitive than through science, although we do teach principles. One of the principles we teach is there's one life. That life is God, and that life is in and through all of life. The Greek philosophers said this. They said even the stones, I think it was Thales, said even the stones are ensouled. And quantum physics is pointing to the same thing, that everything is one, everything is interconnected. There's one life, and there's no separation. So that's a beautiful thing. Some of the experiments that really impressed me, because I've had a lot of, I bet a lot of you have had. Have you ever had a psychic experience where you knew something, you don't know how you knew it, you just knew it? You know, that kind of 
evidence that we're connected to the one mind. Well, here was the experiment that really got me. In 1993, a man named, uh, I don't know how to say the first name. Anybody speak Spanish here? Is it Jacobo? Jacobo? Ramon? Jacobo. Jacobo Grinberg Zilberbaum at the University of Mexico. Come on in. I think there's a couple more seats. One over there, two here. Um, he had this experiment where he had two people that meditated with each other. And they meditated on being connected, you know, being able to be psychically connected. So after about 20 minutes of meditating, he put each of them in a Faraday cage, which is, um, I believe, I don't know if it's made out of lead, but it's, it's a cage through which no signal can possibly pass. So he puts them each in separate Faraday cages. He hooks them up to EEG machines, electroencephalogram. He shows one of the subject a light flash. And at the same time, they both register that evoke, evoke signal on their EEG. <coughs> Amazing. When they went in the Faraday cages, by the way, they continued to meditate on being connected. Now, that experiment was replicated at least five different times in five different countries with different subjects. Sometimes, instead of just two people meditating together, it was a therapist and a client. And they would begin a session, and because of, I used to be a therapist, I should remember this name, and I don't. Because they were attuned to one another, there's a name for it, somebody will come resonance. up with it. Was it? They were resonance? Yes, they were. They were, and there's another and term used. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the, the physicists would say that, yeah. You know, when they, when they were in sync and connected, um, they put them in the cages and the same thing happened. So it didn't even have to be meditation. Now, the same, a similar thing was noticed with small particles. So let's see, I believe it was Alan Aspe, uh, a Frenchman, who took... I think it was photons, Alan, not electrons, right? He took photons that were correlated, tiny particles. He separated them and he moved one halfway across the globe so far that during the time the experiment took place, the speed of light wouldn't have been fast enough for a signal to get through. So what happened was he turned one of the photons and at the very same time, guess what happened? The other one flipped in the same position. Now, go figure, huh? It kind of gives me chills. So two principles of quantum physics that tend to, I don't know what the word is, they tend to corroborate what we're believing in spiritual circles are non-local communication outside of time and space, and that, I'll talk about that a quantum leap in a minute, but non-local signalless communication. In other words, there's one consciousness and we are all connected to it. We're all part of it, not only connected to it. So the other interesting discovery in quantum physics, from my perspective, there's many, and Alan will be covering more, is this idea of discontinuous movement. We all know, and Alan will talk more about this, um, that in mechanistic, materialistic, Newtonian physics, you know, there's certain laws the way things work, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion, right? And uh, there's time and space, and things have to move through time and space. Well, what has been discovered is when an electron switches orbits, it jumps. It makes a quantum leap. It never spends any time in the intervening space. It just happens. And to me, that helps explain and, and Alan will talk more about you know, the whole thing about waves and particles. Everything is energy, everything's in waves until an observer or a consciousness pays attention and then it can crystallize into a particle, into solid stuff, sort of solid. If we look at what atoms and molecules are, they're not really solid, they're mostly space anyway, right? So where was I going with this? Um, quantum leaps. Well, it kind of, I think, to me, points to how prayer can work. Okay, and it also, this idea of signalist communication points to why I can pray for someone in New York and they can be just as affected by that prayer as somebody sitting next to me like Eddie, right? We've seen and heard experiments. I don't know if you've ever seen Greg Braden's stuff. There's a video out where he is praying with a bunch of, uh, or at least chanting with a bunch of Chinese practitioners in a medicineless hospital in China. And a woman who has a very visible tumor on her bladder 
during the time, the 20 minutes or so, that they're chanting and knowing its disappearance, you can see it. You can see it physically shrink. So again, I've got chills. So for me, as a minister, all of this stuff has been very exciting. Um, I think, like a lot of you, I just intuitively feel there's something larger than us, you know, in the atmosphere, in all of us, in all of life, in nature. Um, I intuitively feel that I can communicate with it, that I can be guided by it, that I can pray and it responds. And what quantum physics is telling us and is that that, that that is actually scientifically the case. So I think I'm going to rest my case there for right now, Alan. I know that you're going to go more in detail. Um, yeah, and then we'll certainly have time for questions and discussions. So anything so far you want to add or question so far with me, and then I'll let Alan. OK, you're up. Thank you, Kimberly. She's always a tough act to follow. <laughs> I ah, appreciate your being here today. Um, I'm going to be really personal today. I hope that's OK. <clears throat> because uh, part of this is about my journey and how I ended up you know, believing what I believe. So it's been an, kind of an evolutionary process for me. And um, this was kind of a little outline here. And as you can see, I was a fourth generation Mormon. And um, so it was really in the genes. Um, I had a, a great grandfather who went across the plains pulling a handcart, and um, somewhere in the middle of Wyoming, um, it was a blizzard that hit the handcart company, and he was frozen. They found him underneath the handcart. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of <clears throat> those kind of stories growing up Mormon, a lot of heritage. Um, basically, all my extended family were Mormon. So um, I stuck with it a very long time. And I was a Mormon missionary, the whole, the whole deal. Um, the other day, I was going through the things that in my life that I was really proud of myself, as well as the ones that I wasn't so proud of. And um, one of the ones I was really proud of is I took it to the nth degree for me. And um, eventually, it just got to be such a burden, the cognitive dissonance that I was experiencing, that I had to let it go. But it was very painful, um, and it was very messy because I'd raised five kids, I raised them all Mormon. My wife was very Mormon, and she wasn't about to leave, and she still is. Um, but there's just some things that didn't sit right with me. And I've listed some of them here, like authoritarianism, um, male patriarchy, they emphasized obedience extensively. The first law of heaven was you had to do what you were told. That, that was heaven, OK? <laughs> to, me it was, to me, it was kind of a hell, actually. But uh, well, definitely, blacks and women were second class, although it did have a Revelation 78 about the blacks. That was a good thing. Um, polygamy was in my background. In fact, uh, my grandmother who partially raised me actually was a product of a second wife in a polygamous marriage. So, you know, it was that close to home, so to speak, you know. Um, the culture, as I've indicated, there was very conservative, still is, obviously. Uh, politically, the tribal identity thing was huge. I mean, being a Mormon, it was like you're in this, you know, this little encapsulated sort of thing. Um, black and white thinking, there was a lot of theological superiority, like we've got it and nobody else does, which I know all the hallmarks of fundamentalism. Certainly Mormons aren't the only one in this category, right? And I hope I haven't offended any of you who may have been Mormon, or maybe still are. I have good friends that are still Mormon, and, and I respect them. You know, everybody gets to choose for themselves. But for me, point being, it just wasn't working. Um, anyway, can I get you to move the slide up there for me, please? Ray? Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, and that's fine. Um, like I say, when I broke, I, I really broke, and it was a big, messy ordeal. And um, my kids, actually, when I talked to them, they still remember all, remember all the sort of gory details of that whole thing. So it was traumatic for everybody leaving. It was really hard. Um, I, at the time, was very bitter because I felt like I had been lied to my whole life. And... 
um, as I dug into the history and into um, a lot of the things that were going on in the early history of the church, there's just a lot of lying that happened, a lot of misrepresentation, a lot of uh, exploitation of people. And so it was very, very painful to realize at some point that I'd just been indoctrinated, that I was just culturally imprinted with all this information that wasn't really true. So it was a very difficult time. I spent a year, maybe a couple of years, just in sort of a period of nihilism where I didn't really believe in anything. I just kind of rejected any idea of God. And then there was um, something that happened. I can't even really explain it. Uh, but one day I just sort of woke up and I realized that my life had meaning and purpose. I can't even tell you how or why I believe that. But that began a big spiritual search for me. And I went to a lot of different denominations. I read a lot of kind of new age stuff. And one of the things that I ended up reading that really touched me a lot and that I've sort of over the years been studying is something called the Seth material. And I'll bet a lot of you know that material which I, is sort of foundational for me, and I think was one of the key um, documents in the so-called New Age. Very powerful um, message there. But one of the, the things that they promoted a lot was that you, we create our own reality. And to me, that was really weird. That was kind of strange. And because he says, you know, not only do you create, you know, it's obvious if you have a bad attitude, you're going to create a bad reality for yourself, right? But he said it was more than that. He says you are actually creating all the physical objects that you are seeing in your life. You collectively, as well as individually, are creating all this stuff, right? Through your thoughts, through your feelings, through your emotions, you're creating all this stuff. And that, to me, was a hard sell. That was kind of really difficult to swallow. But then I kind of got into quantum physics. And a lot of that stuff just really makes a lot of sense at this point. And so for me, it has been a marriage, actually, between uh, spirituality and um, quantum physics. And it's, it's been a very fruitful exploration. If I could get you just to move that on up a bit more. And I don't know if we're going to keep going. I don't know if we're going to be able to, sh to hear any of these videos I have right here. Uh, first of all, we're going to go into some of the Seth stuff because I love some of the quotes and you can read them for yourself. You create the reality you know. You have been given perhaps the most awesome gift of all, the ability to project your thoughts outward into physical form. I think it would be important if people don't know that this is channeled material. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, you think objects exist independently of you, not realizing they are instead the manifestations of your own psychological and psychic selves. So it's kind of, in a sense, a really interesting thought is there's kind of a collapse between the perceiver and the perceived, which is really an interesting idea. And uh, there is a, a philosophy called, and I'm going to say, that I'm going to pronounce it wrong, solipsism, I think it is. Solipsism. The, the basically, the only thing I know for sure is that I exist. I don't know about the rest of you, right? So I might just be in this little, you know, capsule sort of a thing and creating this reality and, and making all you guys up. It almost, it almost borders on that, you know, this collapse between the perceiver and the perceived. It's very interesting. Um, uh, Seth says that we create whether we want to or not because some of the things that we create, probably most things we create, are unconscious. So it's not just conscious creation, it's also unconscious creation. Um, a spontaneous exercise in creativity. Um, I'm going to get you to move that up a little bit more, please. Wrong way. There we go. Um, there's one here I really like. I want to be sure we can do this one here. Um, no, 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 no. Go back. Yeah. Go back up. Yeah, thanks. Oh, here. This one I really like, number five. You are basically made of the same ingredients as a chair, a stone, a head of lettuce, a bird. 
in a gigantic cooperative endeavor, all consciousness joins together to make the forms you perceive. In other words, we're all, everything is made of the same stuff, and we're going to learn in a little while that that stuff is basically the ingredients of the quantum field. It's, it's, it's all the same stuff. It has different characteristics because there's different combinations of different energies there, but it's all basically the same stuff. And if you want to call that same stuff, that whole quantum field, God, you know, that works as well as anything. All that is, God, source, whatever you want to call it. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and move on up to the next one. And uh, so anyway, this is sort of a um, summary of, of what Seth has been teaching. We individually and collectively project our thoughts and feelings outward and create physical reality. This process may be conscious or unconscious. Objects of physicality are not separate from us, the creator. That is the collapse of the perceiver and the perceived. The camouflage is made of all the same basic stuff, including your body, all of which are only different in their configurations. And this one is not stated per se in what I quoted, but other sets stuff would indicate physical reality is all alive and malleable. In fact, we may be living in a simulation, and that's a whole other subject I won't get into, <laughs> but it's also, I think, really accurate. I think we are living in a simulation. Okay, let's move that on up, and I, I hope, I don't know if we've got any of this stuff worked out with the audio yet, is that? Well, not yet, but we'll try this video. Okay. Um, this gives a little history of how quantum physics developed, and I know a lot of you know this stuff already, so it's going to be old stuff, maybe for most of you. Tonight, I'd like to tell you about one of the big questions in science. It's a question that goes back at least two and a half thousand years to the ancient Greeks. And it's a question that has been discussed in this room many, many times over the past 200 years. But it's an important question, and I think it's important that, that we revisit it. And the question is simply this. It's, what are we made of? What are the fundamental building blocks of nature that you and me and everything else in the universe are constructed from. That's the story I'd, I'd like to tell you. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, try and uh, give you an overview of our current understanding. Uh, I'd also like to try and give you an overview of where we hope to go in the future, of what progress we can, we can hope to make in the next uh, few years and few decades. And we're going to cover quite a lot of ground in, in this talk, I, sh I should warn you now. Um, not least because I'm going to discuss every single thing in the universe, quite literally. <laughs> um, we're going to talk, amongst other things, about uh, what's happening at the world's most powerful particle collider, this is uh, a machine that's called the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC for short. It'll come up a lot in this talk. And it's a machine which is based underground uh, in a place called CERN, which is just outside Geneva. We'll also talk about uh, experiments in the last few years that look backwards in time uh, towards the Big Bang, that give us some understanding about uh, what was happening in the first few fractions of a second after uh, time itself uh, started to exist. And on top of all this, I also want to give you some idea about uh, the theoretical abstract ideas and even a little bit idea about the mathematics that underlies our current understanding of, uh, of the universe. Uh, because I'm a theoretical physicist. What I do is um, study the equations, try to understand the equations that, uh, that, that govern uh, the world we live in. And so I'd just like to give you a flavor of, of, of what that's about. Uh, at some point, I should warn you now, at some point, um, I'm even going to show you an equation. Okay, uh, you know that you can get sent on training courses for this kind of uh, this kind of thing. There's a number one rule. The number one rule is never show them any equations. If you show them equations, you'll just terrify them. Um, at some point in this lecture, you're all going to be terrified. So just <laughs> prepare yourselves. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's a traditional way to start talks like this. Uh, the traditional way is to be very cultured and talk about what Democritus and Lucretius said two and a half thousand years ago and the ideas uh, that the ancient Greeks had about, about atoms. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to start like this. We, we've made a lot of progress in two and a half thousand years, and, you know, there's just better places to, uh, to kick off a, a, a science talk. Um, so the first modern picture that we had uh, of what the universe is made of, or everything uh, we're made of, um, is this. 
So I hope this is uh, familiar to, to most people here. This is the periodic table of elements. Okay, it's one of the most iconic images in, in, in all of science. Uh, what we have here are 120-ish different elements. Uh, I should point out no less than 10 of which were discovered in this very building. And which constitute, or at least in the uh, 1800s, were thought to constitute everything that existed in, in nature. So it's certainly true that any material you get, you can distill it down into its component parts, and you'll find that all of those component parts are made of one of these 120 uh, elements. So it's, it, it's a great moment in science. It's really uh, one of the, the triumphs of science. Uh, it's also, I should add, uh, the reason that I stopped doing chemistry in school. <laughs> because if you're a chemist, this is basically as good as it gets. <laughs> and, you know, if we're honest, it's kind of a mess, right? I, you know, everything in the universe is classified into things on the left that go bang if you put them in water, through to things on the right, which really, if we're honest, don't do very much at all. It, you kind of organize everything into this stupid shape. So there, there's a, you know, it looks a little bit like Australia. There's a big dip in the top, and then, and then there's these two strips of elements that you have to put along the bottom because there's no room for them in the middle where they belong. You know, it, I don't know about you, if, if I was asked to come up with a fundamental classification of everything in the universe, this isn't what I would have gone for. Are there any chemists in the audience? <laughs> I'm sorry for you. <laughs> okay, but you know, I'm, I'm not alone in this. Uh, it's, it's not just uh, me that thinks this is a silly way to organize nature. Nature itself thinks this is a silly way to, to organize nature. Of course, we, we know this isn't the fundamental, uh, this isn't the end of the story. This isn't the fundamental building blocks. And uh, the first person to realize there's, that there's something deeper uh, than this, um, was a Cambridge physicist called J.J. Thompson. So at the end of the 1800s, J.J. Thompson discovered a particle that was smaller than an atom uh, that we now call the electron. And in 1897, he announced this uh, in this room, in fact, in, in this very lecture series, um, to uh, a stunned audience. Uh, an audience that was so stunned, at least half of them didn't believe what he was saying. There was one very distinguished scientist who afterwards told J.J. Thompson he thought the whole thing was a hoax, that J.J. Thompson had just been uh, pulling their leg. Um, but of course, it's, it, it's not a hoax. This isn't the fundamental uh, elements of nature. And um, within 15 years of J.J. Thompson's discovery, his successor in Cambridge, a man called Ernest Rutherford, had figured out exactly what these atoms are made of. And this is the picture that, uh, that Rutherford came up with. So we now know that each of these elements consists of a nucleus, uh, which uh, is tiny, the uh, metaphor that Rutherford himself used was it's like a fly in the center of the cathedral. And then orbiting this nucleus in, I should add, fairly blurry orbits are the electrons, which uh, sort of fill out very sparsely the rest of the space. So that's a picture of, of, of these atoms. Um, subsequently, we learned that uh, the nucleus uh, is not itself fundamental. The nucleus contains uh, smaller particles. They're particles that we call protons and neutrons. And in the 1970s, uh, we learned that the protons and neutrons aren't fundamental either. So in the 1970s, we learned that inside each proton and neutron are three smaller particles uh, that we call quarks. Uh, there are two different kinds of quarks. Um, by the 1970s, I, I'm guessing physicists didn't have a classical Greek education and they'd kind of run out of, you know, classy names. So we, we call these quarks uh, the up quark and the down quark, okay? <laughs> For no good reason. It's not like the up quark is higher than the down quark. It's not like it points up. It's just no, no good reason at all. The up quark and the down quark. So the proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark, and the neutron consists of two down quarks and an up quark, okay? This, as far as we know, are the fundamental building blocks of, of nature. Uh, we've never discovered anything smaller than the electron, and we've never discovered anything smaller than uh, the quarks. So we have three particles of which everything we know is made. And it's, it's worth stressing, it, that's kind of astonishing. You know, it's, uh, we sort of take it for granted. We learn this in school, we don't really think about it deeply. Everything we see in the world, all the diversity in the natural world, you, me, everything around us, we just the same uh, three particles 
with slightly different rearrangements repeated over and over and over again. Okay, it's, uh, it's an amazing lesson to, uh, to draw about how, how the world is, is put together. So that, that, that's what we have. We have an electron and, uh, and two quarks. And, um, you know, these aren't the fundamental building blocks that the Greeks had thought about, and they're certainly not the fundamental building blocks that the Victorians had thought about. But, uh, you know, the spirit of the issue really hasn't changed. The spirit is exactly what uh, Democritus uh, said 200, 2,500 years ago. It, it's that there are like Lego bricks from which everything in the world is constructed. These Lego bricks are particles, and the particles are the electron and two quarks. It's a very nice picture. It's a very comforting picture. It's the picture we teach kids at school. It's the uh, picture we even teach our students in undergraduate university. And there's a problem with it. Uh, the problem is, it's a lie. <laughs> it's, it's a white lie. It's a white lie that we tell our children because, you know, we don't want to um, expose them to the, the difficult and horrible truth too early on. It makes it easier to learn if you believe that, that these particles are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. But it's simply not true. The best theories that we have of physics do not have underlying them the quark particle and the two quark particle, and the, 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 sorry, the electron particle and the two quark particles. In fact, the very best theories we have of physics don't rely on particles at all. The best theories we have tell us that the fundamental building blocks of nature are not particles, but something much more nebulous and abstract. The fundamental building blocks of nature are fluid-like substances which are spread throughout the entire universe and ripple in strange and interesting ways. Okay? That's the fundamental reality in, in which we live. Uh, these fluid-like substances we have a name for, uh, we call them fields. Uh, you know, can I add something in here? Yeah. Because what you've said is, um, again, you know, from my perspective, we teach, um, as you know, when we pray, there's this quantum field that we call God, and it's responsive. And so there's something called, we call the law, which is that part of the divine that responds. It can't say no. It, it just says yes. And it's, uh, we call it unformed substance. You've heard that when we teach, unformed substance. And when we pray, like Seth said, we get to create our reality. We get to create the physical things around us. We get to create our experiences. Well, that's exactly what quantum physics is saying about this, cause, this, this quantum field. It's the same thing as the unformed substance out of which we create as the divine creates. You know, there's downward, downward causation from the divine, which is everywhere, and, but that we are creators as well. So I just think it's another way in which quantum theory has kind of said, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I, what I didn't say earlier was the difference, too, between the materialistic view and philosophy, which is that, you know, atoms created molecules, created cells, created the brain, created consciousness. And quantum physics says no. Right. No, 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 right. no. Consciousness right. is, and consciousness split itself into individualized expressions, you and me. It, it, and when, the, when we die, when the brain dies, consciousness doesn't die. The quantum monad lives on, it's eternal, it's immortal. So, right. thank you for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, you know, that's a very fundamental question that we really, um, the quantum physics illuminates is, is that material, physical stuff emanates from consciousness and that it doesn't emanate from material things. Like, for example, the brain is a big one. The brain is, is our consciousness produced by a brain and physical scientists have been looking for years and years and years to try to figure out how your brain actually can produce something like the taste of chocolate, the feel of velvet, you know, all these kind of things that we experience, okay, our consciousness. Is that actually produced by the brain or is the brain just receiving a message from a higher source, our own mind, and translating that into our language so that we can say it in words and produce images? So if the brain, of course, is damaged, then it's going to come out garbled. It's sort of, they compare it to a radio receiver, okay? So the radio receiver isn't actually, you know, producing the message. It's just transmitting the message. 
Anyway, it's a big subject. I don't know how much of this I want to get into without being able to listen to the videos, frankly. Um, anyway, just in some about the quantum field, it's pervasive, the whole universe, it's a field of possibilities. It's collapsed by consciousness, apparently. The double slit experiment is probably the fundamental experiment uh, in quantum physics. And um, it's sort of hard to explain in so many words. So that's why I, I really need you know, the video to do that. So I think I'm probably just going just gonna to call it at the present time, because I don't know that I can do this without you know, actually presenting the videos. So. Um, yeah, that's not a smart TV. It's just a screen. So, yeah. 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 I mean, I could go get my computer, but go ahead. Yeah. Schrodinger's cat? Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't actually talk about Schrodinger's cat, but yeah, Schrodinger was one of the real influential guys in terms of his equation, which supposedly would help give you probabilities of where things existed in superposition, meaning that instead of these little particles there, it's a cloud of possibilities, right? And his equation was going to tell you the probability of where it was at. So anyway, uh, anyway, I apologize. I, I, I I'm not sure that I can actually really do this much justice uh, without the the videos. But I will say we can read the summaries anyway. Um, that if you, I think you've all seen this probably before. I suspect. So I, I think you're probably all familiar with it. Anyway, the summary of the video is monochromatic light shines on two slits, and it produces an interference pattern like waves. Sand particles, just to give you a contrast, the way, the way that particles behave versus waves. Uh, if you put them through two inverted slits, you get two piles of sand, obviously. If you fire atoms at a single slit, you get a particle pattern. Whereas if you fire atoms at two slits, you get an interference pattern. A single atoms fired one at a time through two slits, you get an interference pattern. Single atoms fired at two slits with a detector that actually is detecting, say, the top slit, um, produce a particle pattern which 50% go through the top, presumably 50% through the bottom. Uh, single atoms fired at two slits with no detector, you get an interference pattern. So if you just move that slide up, if and you would. So the point of that, I what, think, uh, right, is, yeah. that, is that the detector is a form of consciousness or a form of observation. Right, right. right. Yeah. Um, show the video, just show the... No, no, I, I, yeah, that's just too hard to do. Um, so anyway, I, I try to uh, summarize what this means. It, it's sort of confusing. And this is, a lot of people really get stumped on this one. Um, but this is the conclusions that I drew from the experiment. It seems that the atoms or field seem to be conscious in that if we, as conscious observers, can deduce only one pathway for the atoms, they show up as particles. If, on the other hand, there is ambiguity as to which slit they go through, then a wave pattern is produced. So it seems as if the field is conscious uh, of the uncertainty of situations where there is no known way for us as conscious agents to determine the course of the atoms. So apparently, we collapse the wave function by choosing a non-ambiguous outcome. Now this, you know, this is my summary and I take responsibility for it, but to me that's what makes the most sense about the whole thing. Okay, in other words, it's, the universe is waiting for us to actually decide something definitively. And then it'll show up as a particle. When we're just sort of like, yeah, 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 could be this, it could be that, I don't know yet, then it doesn't show up. And I'm going to explain to you what's known as the central mystery of quantum mechanics. It was a Richard Feynman, the American physicist, said, this is the central mystery of quantum mechanics. There's lots of weird stuff that goes on in the quantum world. Hit you with this, and it basically tells you what it's all about. It's called the two-slit experiment. I'll start with this. Imagine you have a source of light shining against a screen with two slits. Now, for the pedants in the audience, this source of light has to be monochromatic light, light of a particular wavelength, whereas, of course, a light bulb is white light, and that's made up of all the colors of the spectrum, lots of different wavelengths. But imagine this is just a single wavelength of light, and you can see the light is coming out in, 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 in 
in waves like, like ripples in a pond. That's the nature of you know, wave-like behavior. As the light hits the screen, it squeezes through the two slits. And each slit, in turn, on the other side, becomes almost like a new source of light. And the light spreads out. It diffracts. And as the waves of light overlap, they will interfere with each other. So where a crest hits uh, a trough, they will cancel. Where a crest hits a crest, they will amplify, and so on. And so on the back screen, you end up with what's called an interference pattern, a, a, a series of light and dark fringes, where the waves have either cancelled out or worked together in phase. That's fine. That's not quantum mechanics. That's a property of light that goes back over 200 years that we've known about since the early 19th century. Imagine doing the same experiment again, but doing it not with waves, but with particles. Do it with grains of sand. So this is the same experiment, but I've tipped it 90 degrees. Rather than waves that are spread out that wash up against the two slits and squeeze through, here you've got individual particles of sand and each particle will either go through one slit or the other and so you see they will sort of drain through and you get two bumps underneath each of the slits so the two peaks is reminiscent of particle like behavior whereas the the multiple pattern of interference is wave like behavior what if we do the same experiment with atoms well uh, so imagine we have an atom gun, something that can fire uh, atoms, a, a stream of atoms. You can't see them because they're very small. Let's block off one of the two slits. So these two slits are, are you know, the, the, the dimensions and separation of the slits is, is, is chosen appropriately to, to show us uh, how atoms do things. And so far, so good. Nothing strange here. You'll see a lot of atoms hitting the back screen. So this will now have to be some sort of photosensitive screen where, whereby when an atom hits it, they'll, it'll give off a little flash of light to say the atom has arrived here. So the atoms are arriving as these little pinpricks of light that we see. Of course, a lot of the atoms will be blocked by the first screen. They won't go through that slit. Uh, but those that do get through to the other side, you can see there's a bit of spreading of, of, of the atoms. But if we didn't know anything about atoms, you'd say, well, that's fine. We can understand that. Um, some, a lot of the atoms are going clean through the slit. Some are sort of maybe bouncing off the edge of the slit, and so they're sort of being deflected a bit, which is why you get a bit, a bit of a spread. The first mystery of quantum mechanics comes when we open the second slit. Because now we see something that's very much like the interference pattern we got with light. Rather than having two bands of, of, of uh, spots where the atoms have gone through the two slits, it's as though the atoms have gone through the slits behaving like waves, and, 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 and you get interference of the waves, and you get these bands. If we know nothing about atoms or quantum mechanics, you could try and rationalize it and say, well, you know, maybe atoms behave in a very strange way, and um, only a certain number of them are allowed to all sit together. And so, you know, me and my gang, we're all going to go on this slit. No, sorry, no room for you. You go to the next slit above. And by the way, there's this rule that no one can go in between the, the two bands, but a few naughty atoms do. So there's a bit of a, a scatter. You know, we don't, there could be some forces between atoms that make them coordinate their actions in a way to give this pattern. That's not mysterious. That's just, we just don't know how atoms do things. But we can be clever, and we can force the issue. What if we were to not send the atoms all through at once, but send them through one at a time? Leave enough of a gap for the atom to get through to hit the screen. Of course, as I say, some atoms will um, hit, the, uh, hit the, the, the first screen and not get through. But those that get through will hit the back screen. So let's run the experiment again slowly. And gradually, you'll see, as the atoms go through, they'll be, look like they're just randomly arriving on, on the other side. You keep sending atoms through one at a time, and gradually, that same pattern appears. So each atom, by itself, is somehow contributing its small part 
to the overall wave-like behavior that we see in the interference pattern. How does it do it? How, how, how does, we know the atom is a tiny localized particle, we can't see it, it's too small to even see under a microscope, we're firing it at the, the, the screen with the two slits, some moment later you see a flash of light on the back screen. It's arrived in a localized point, it's not spread itself out, you don't get sort of like a wash of a, sort of a, a faint light across the whole screen, it's a little point, the atom is localized, it's arrived in a certain location, and yet, it somehow seems to have been aware of there being two slits, not one, because it's given rise to this interference pattern. How does one atom do that? Does it split in half? Does it become like a, a cloud that goes through both? Well, we can try and be even cleverer. What if we were to spy on the atom and see where it goes? We can just gently just observe which slit it goes through. So you put a detector just above the upper slit that will flash or beep whenever it sees an atom go through that top slit. Sure enough, you fire the atoms through one at a time. 50% of the time, the detector will beep. The other 50% of the time it doesn't, the assumption being that the atom has gone through the lower slit. But of course, I've been cheeky here. I haven't shown you the results of the experiment. That's what you get. 50% of the time, it beeps, and you see a spot arrive adjacent to the upper slit. The other half of the time, it doesn't beep, but you see a spot arrive at the lower slit. So, yeah, it's picked out the atoms that have gone through the upper slit and not the ones that have gone through. So each atom does go through one slit or the other. But that's a different result to what we had earlier. So here's the last bit of sneakiness that we can play with atoms. Surely now, you know, we, we're, we're going to get to grips with it. Leave the detector there, but just very quietly go and unplug it. <laughs> Don't let the atoms know that you're not spying on them. Make them think that you're still detecting them. So, yeah, 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 okay, we're going to run the experiment. Atoms, okay, get ready, one at a time. We're going to be checking on you. All right, so run the experiment again. <laughs> now, if you can explain this using common sense and logic, <laughs> do let me know, because there's a Nobel Prize for you. You go, you know, according to Einstein, faster than the speed of light, all the theories about quantum physics and everything that they're built on sort of dissipate. So this is like, you know, what he called spooky action at a distance yeah. because it really bothered him because his theories were basically based on the, the speed of light being the maximum velocity possible. So what it tells me, and I, I'd like to actually get some feedback on this with well, entanglement. <laughs> yeah, let me just say my little piece here first is, is that what it says to me is that there is a reality that's beyond time and space. Yeah. That's what it says yeah. to me. And so if you want to look at it as God, all that is, whatever, you know, whatever, there's a reality beyond this sphere, and this sphere and our universe is created with time and space as being the constants. And it's also very interesting that all the things we figured out in physics and quantum physics are all amenable. In fact, they're all derived from mathematical equations. So isn't it interesting that math seems to be the underlying principle in time and space? And this is implying that, hey, guess what, folks? That may be the case here, but there's other realms, there's other existences, there's other dimensions where time and space don't apply in the same way. That's what it says to me. But I'd be open to anybody's interpretation of entanglement. Yeah. Yeah, what I've been studying is that, you know, in three dimensional space where we live, yeah. there are universal principles applicable, applicable to three dimensional space. But when you go to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimensions, then there are different universal mm -hmm. principles. And one is that time doesn't exist. Right. And that everything is happening at the same time. Time. Exactly. So time and space then don't exist as we know it. Right. When you get to these other higher dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. And so the way I see it is most spiritual 
paths are an effort to exist more in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimensions, mm. right. where there are different universal principles, mm. where it is faster than the speed of light, where it is, I mean, I've heard it described as cosmic energy or, you know, um, you know subatomic, but different than what we study in three-dimensional mm. reality. That's also my understanding, so we, yeah, I share that, that. So if you get into, you know, if in your meditation, if you get into the fourth, fifth, sixth dimensions, right. um, you have at your fingertips instantaneously all the information in the universe. Mm. And then you begin working in a completely different uh, realm. Reality. Right, exactly. And then we should also mention that all these different dimensions are frequency based, right? Vibrationally based. Yes, yes. So, I mean, you know, when we, for example, incarnate from a higher dimension, presumably, into this earth plane, which is a very dense plane. We're in kindergarten here, folks, so I hate to tell you that. <laughs> but it goes, you know, there's this thing that happens that goes from. <laughs> there we are. There we are. There we are. <laughs> it's kind of the way it is. We're, we're down here at this very low dimension, but it's a training ground, you know, because what we put out comes back to us, and this is a very physical, tangible way of experiencing, um, you know, some form of karma, whatever you want to call it. What you put out comes back, and so it's a very great opportunity to learn. That's the whole point, I think, of the whole deal, you know. Um, there's a great documentary out there called the simulation hypothesis documentary it's a real it's a real jewel it's almost an hour but it's well worth your time because it goes into all the details about this whole thing it's very good uh, why don't you just slip down a little did further. Morel have something you, you yeah did to you say? have something you want to say um, when you were talking about faster than the speed of light there's actually not any speed at all it is it's in the same moment. Mm -hmm. it's, speed has nothing to do with it. It's not relevant. Instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah, because speed has to do with time and space. Right. right. Sure. So in the dimensions where there. Right. Where there's no, no time and space. space. There is no speed. Right. But right. but our experience here, you know, ostensibly is time and space, right? Unless so. you're having a psychic experience. Yeah. Where yep. you are hearing this person's thoughts as sure. they are thinking that. Yeah, yeah. As this gentleman mentioned, perhaps when you're in a deep meditation, maybe you can transcend the time and space. As well, yeah. And other, I'm sure, other things too. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, scroll, scroll on down a little bit more, if you would, please. I'm almost done with this. What was the name of that? The, the Simulation that? Hypothesis Documentary. It's really a beautiful one. Um, Let's see. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, the one by Joe Dispenza is a jewel. Um, I really, really like what he has to say. So if you're walking around your life feeling sorry for yourself and feeling like a victim, you are broadcasting that signature into the field, and you will create more experiences to suffer. What is the simple definition of quantum? Quantum physics says that your mind and matter are so in intimately connected that it's impossible to separate the two. That matter has a mind and mind is in matter. And you can't pull them apart. And so Newtonian physics, the world we live in, is the physics of the predictable. Okay, we're going to shoot a rocket to the moon. We need to know the distance, we need to know the speed, and because we can figure out all of those elements, we could say that Newtonian physics, we can predict where we're going. We can predict how much time it takes. But the quantum model of reality is about the unpredictable. It's about this place of uncertainty. And so in quantum physics, it's amazing because when they started studying the very very tiny particles in atoms, like electrons and photons. They expected that those particles
particles would behave like planets rotating around the sun. Predictably, but they don't. They respond to mind. And so now, all of a sudden, the quantum physicist comes along to measure the electron. And the electron goes from a wave of possibility and all that energy collapses into a particle and it's called collapsing the wave function. They turn their back and no longer look and observe the electron and it turns back into energy. So mind is affecting matter. So, I have drank martinis with quantum physicists till sunrise hundreds of times. And they always say, well, the observer effect works really well for the tiny, small subatomic particles, but not for the very large. And I always say the same, same thing to them. Yeah, the observer does work for the very tiny and not for the very large, but what if we're poor observers? What if we can get better at observation? In other words, if you wake up every morning and you do the same thing all every, that you've been doing for the last 10 years, then you're caught in the predictable world of Newtonian physics. And if you're doing the same thing over and over again, we can take your past and lift it up and set it on your future and it's going to be exactly the same. So then if you're viewing your life from the same level of mind every single day, then you are collapsing the same possibilities into the same reality. So if you teach people then to find the present moment, in quantum physics, all possibilities exist in the present moment. But most people's brains are anticipating the future based on the past, and they're not present. So then it requires training. It requires people retreating from their lives and practicing finding the present moment and beginning to change their habits and their thoughts and their behaviors. However, when you live by the hormones of stress, most people don't know this, but there's an invisible field of energy around your body. And when you react to someone or something, you draw from this invisible field and you turn it into chemistry. And the field around your body shrinks. How do I know? I measured it. And now you're more matter and less energy. You're more particle and less wave. And most people then, when you are matter trying to change matter, you always try to force the outcome. You try to control the outcome. You try to predict the outcome. And people then get competitive or they hold on or they manipulate or they cheat or they steal because that's the only way they can get what they want. But the quantum model of reality, when you are truly in the present moment, and we've measured this in brain scan after brain scan, you forget that you're a woman. You forget your name. You forget your age. You forget your culture. You forget your past. You forget your future. You forget that you have a body. You forget that you have parents. When you're truly in the present moment, you go from putting your attention on your body, your environment and time, to becoming nobody. No one, no thing, nowhere, in no time. You become a thought, alone, in possibility. And if you are going to heal your body by thought alone, or change something in your life by thought alone, then you have to become thought alone. And teaching people how to linger in this place of the unknown is what begins to change their energy. We also measured when a person begins to open their heart and they can begin to sustain an elevated emotion, they begin to broaden the magnetic field around their body to nine meters wide. Now they're more energy than matter. They're more wave than particle. And they can exert better effects on reality. So then think of when you open your heart, this is science, like dropping a pebble in water. You produce a ripple. 
if you drop a bigger stone, you produce a bigger ripple. If you're able to sustain that state, you keep dropping the same rock over and over again, and you broadcast a signature into the field. The emotion is the magnetic charge. Your intention, your thought, is the information that's carried on that wave. And when you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you begin to produce an effect on matter. You see, the thoughts that you think are the electrical charge in the quantum field. The feelings that you emote are the magnetic charge in the quantum field. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back. So if you're walking around your life feeling sorry for yourself and feeling like a victim, you are broadcasting that signature into the field and you will create more experiences to suffer. And sin is an attitude. And sin is how you think and how you feel. It takes training. And it takes practice. And it takes learning new information and deprogramming ourselves into believing that we're limited. Because just like people believe that an infection can produce a disease amongst the community, I believe that wellness is as infectious as disease. But if you're living by the hormones of stress and you have no energy, no field, then you can't produce an effect on matter. So then, life is about the management of energy. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And if your attention is on the knowns and in the predictable future, or your attention is on the familiar emotions of the past, you are siphoning energy out of the present moment and you have no energy to create with. Getting people beyond their identity, getting people beyond their past, getting people beyond predicting their future, getting people beyond their faces or their wardrobes or their sports cars or their importance, getting beyond all those things is when they begin to make contact with the quantum field. You can't enter the quantum field as a somebody you have to enter as a nobody. And when you're able to do this and practice it really well, you will begin to do what's innately your birthright, and that is to create an unknown or wonderful experience in your life. So it just takes practice in order to do it. It's like yeah. an exercise, but if we're going in as titans, and then we're, and we're going to go back to being titans, like why, what's... I don't know what is the point. Yeah. In order to make the in order to make the simulation every, in order to make the simulation real, you have to kind of wipe the slate clean and you're coming into it, you know, with no preconceptions, with no idea of what you've done before, what you've been before, everything you learned before, it's wiped clean and it's like a new experience. Of course, it's not really new. You've done it many times previously. Probably most of us have done it thousands of times previously. And we come in with a certain core um, signature of our energy, our, our soul energy, um, which is you know, produced from lifetime to lifetime and persists from lifetime to lifetime. But the details are wiped clean. And I think it's a very good reason. If we could remember all the things from all our past experiences, I'm not sure that this would be a very meaningful experience. A doable experience. And yet, just to put another twist on it, not everything's wiped clean. Mm -hmm. Because you hear, you know, people who have memories from past reincarnations, for example, the Dalai Lama choices where people can find money that was hidden centuries ago and nobody knew where it was, but they know. So kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, it, it says actually in Viveka Chudamani that the body dies and the electrical fields die, but what the, the, that the mind and intellect continue on. We come, like you say, we come, we have a soul. What, what do you call it? Soul in Korean? A soul, yeah. And um, the, the thing that keeps us coming back, according to Vedanta, is karma, actions, seeds of actions that have been planted before. 
and to burn those seeds, getting into the present moment, meditating on the present moment, being in the present moment burns the seeds so that the, you shorten the time that you're, you have to come back. I mean, yeah. Not but I think it's a great question, isn't it? I mean, the mystery of why we're here. And well, I, I just wanted to go back to something from, from the video, too, because what he described there, when we're in that space of being nobody, and when we have good feelings, and we're in that high vibration when we can really create, so we teach about prayer. You know, that the emotion behind it is the fire that fuels it, and you intend, and you let go. He's really describing why prayer works, at least in our in our. Well, and the power of that, you know, Dr. Len Hugh in Honolulu years ago, he was a psychiatrist and he yeah, came into that mental ward for the criminally insane where people were leaving, there was turnover, people feared for their lives, it was awful, people were hurting each other. He never saw a patient. He sat in his office, he looked at everyone's file and said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Very slowly, and, and it was. It was and, People started to stay, people got, the prisoners got well, they left, they ended up closing the whole unit. Yeah, yeah, that's the power of that prayer. That's a wave. <laughs> yeah. When does your church meet? 10.30, Sunday mornings. We have a 10 o'clock meditation that goes to about 10.20 beforehand. But every Sunday, and it's at Unity um, downtown on Holly Street. Yeah, we, we run the service uh, the first three Sundays. Unity runs the service on the fourth Sunday. And we do, a, on that weekend of the fourth Sunday, we do a Friday evening Teze service, which is a very meditative um, chanting prayer, very meditative candlelight service. So if you want to be on our mailing list, just you know, give Vivian or me your email and then you'll know what's going on <laughs> yeah appreciate everybody thank you for coming yeah tonight. thank you all thank you, thank you.